the mic didn't work because I didn't plug in my uh, other thing. Okay, now it's working, but it's too loud. But the screen did record. Okay, so let's see how this turns out because I forgot to bring my uh, the little UFO thing. Okay, go ahead and repeat your question, please. That would give you the same result as what we see here. Okay, let me go back to the B. We will slow. So if you have your 1B and 2A, it would have been about the same thing, except this would be 1A, 1B and this would have been 2A. So it would still be a function. So let me give you something that is not a function. And I have to count the number of lines to copy. So we have seven lines, okay, seven y y and paste, okay. So I'm going to change the membership a little bit here, and I'm going to add one more, okay, just, yeah, one b is over here, okay. So now, you know, the, the rest will have to change. So I'm going to change, I'm going to leave out the portions that is not the same as before, or potentially not the same as before, so we're going to have to reevaluate some parts of this. So I'm going to take out these because they may not apply anymore. There we go. Okay. The format stays the same. Okay. We can also we can still see that the loop of may not be able to see the bottom. Let me scroll up a little bit. There we go. So the format for the structure really has not changed. Because I still need to go through every element in the domain, and that sets up u to be 1, u to be 2. Okay? But when I evaluate the set that we are constructing for every value of in the domain, the result of this is now different from the one before. And what would that be in this case? In other words, I'm looking for all the two tuples in F that starts with 1 in each two tuples. So what do you think that should look like this time? Yep, so in this case, it will be 1A and also 1B. So when I look at the cardinality and I ask, does it equal to 1? The answer is, it's false because it is 0 this time, okay? Now, because everything is ended together, in other words, this false is going to be ended in conjunction with whatever this is. I can actually conclude that way and say that this f is not a function. But I don't want to do that. Okay? I don't want to do the short circuit evaluation just because I want you guys to also see that, oh, this part really has not changed. Because the where to maps to has not changed from the earlier example. So this part is really still the same as before. So we still have, you know, this set is still the same as before, which is a 2B. And as a result, um, this is still true. But it doesn't really matter, because you know, the true false value for each value in the domain, they're all ended together. They're all in a big conjunction, which means that if one is false, the entire thing is going to be false. Is that okay? And that's the reason why for this particular f, it is not a function. So is that helpful? I mean, do you guys kind of, can you relate the more procedural way of looking at things to the notation or the universal quantifier? Yes. So essentially, if we see 1a and 1b automatically inside the small, because even the first element of the first element. Correct. But you are looking, so you're, if you're looking at it from the semantic perspective, which is the meaning behind you know, the symbols, then the answer is yes, because your one is not to more than one element in the code domain. Exactly. So even if you have one A and then you have two A and two B, it will still be false because the B. Say that one more time. If you have one A mm -hmm. and then you have two B, mm -hmm. you still have false because Two, because 2 is mapped to both A and B. Correct. Yeah. 
All right. So I'm not going to work this one entirely out, but I'm going to, yes, go ahead. So do you want to do another example where f is a function or is not a function? There are many ways for it not to be a function. Exactly how many ways? Okay, let me see if you guys have been paying attention. How many ways can we pick um, f as a subset of the Cartesian product where it is not a function? 12, because it is 16 minus 4. Okay, very good. <laughs> You guys, you know, do you see how everything is connected? You know, the, the one thing that I started opening up here when I was still panting because I'm running up the stairs <coughs> eventually connects to this because I can give you up to 12 unique examples where f is not a function. Some of those are really easy, like the empty set. What? What about the definition of the because, um, okay, there are two things, okay, so there are two things together, says the two has become from the golden link. The first one is F is a subset of the Cartesian product. And the second one being Q is the second item in the two tree. So when you combine those two, then we know that Q has to come from the golden link. All right, so, um, so we, have, we still have to get back to the question that I asked. Um, do you want an example where it is where f is not a function or where f is a function? Um, the second example is when f is not a function. Correct. That's one way for f not to be a function. And there are 12 ways. <laughs> We should be fine. Okay, I'll, I'll give you guys one more. Okay, how about that? I'll give you guys one more example where f is not a function. So I'm going to do a, another 7 by y, paste, and this time I go like, uh, let's see. Let's do it like this, okay? We'll, we'll just take out things this time. There we go. And once again, I'm going to take out things that that needs to be determined. Okay, so we'll go ahead and reset everything here. There we go. And there we go. Oh, okay. All right, so let me scroll on the right-hand side so we can all see the question. Okay, so I think most of you can tell that f is not a function because one of the elements in the domain is missing entirely as a first item of a two tuple in F. But that is a very casual or a intuitive way of answering the question. I want this to be mechanical, okay? So why is it important to be able to look at things like this mechanically instead of just going for, oh, I understand the meaning of this, I can solve this problem. So why, why, do, why do I want to go for a mechanical way of understanding something and doing something as opposed to, oh, I know how to do this. I, I know this, you know, just intuitively, I know the answer. That is correct. But it is also because this is a computer science class, right? So what do we do in computer science that math people do not do? Implement things in the real world? <laughs> and is that a casual thing? Is it an intuitive thing? Or is it a mechanical thing? It is mechanical. That is why, okay? So, well, okay. It is still mechanical. I guess yeah, when AI gets to the point where it is super intelligent, it might be more intuitive, okay? But we're not quite there yet, okay? As much as we, as much as I want it to be there, and you don't want it to be there, it is not there yet. So that's good news for you guys. Why do you think I said that? Yes. Yes, because it makes it very difficult for you to find a job. You have to outdo the AI in order to get hired. All right, so let's go ahead and work with this one. Okay, so when E is 1, 
what is the membership of this particular set? What is in it? Who's in it? Okay. 1A, that's right. Okay, so 1A as a 2 tuple is in that set. So when I look at the cardinality and said and ask, is that one? Yeah, it is one. Not a problem. Okay, are we good so far? So when E is 2 and I'm asking how, what are the elements in F that starts with a 2 in the 2 tuple? Uh, it's empty. Because this particular F does not have a single 2 tuple that starts with 2. So that's why this is an empty set when E equals to 2. Is that okay? So when I look at the cardinality and ask, is the cardinality of the empty set 1? No, the answer is false. So once again, we have true and false, and as a result, this particular f, the way it is defined here, is not a function. Yep? but it's also very detailed and in an exam I don't want you guys to spend all the time just you know, writing so typically what I would ask in this case is um, using okay let me, let me go back to the original expression because it does matter you know, with what that is okay so in the exam I would prob I would probably ask you which element of X give me at least one element in X where this statement is false so in our example, okay, the last example, you will tell me that when e equals to 2, when e equals to 2, then this expression is false, and that's why we can conclude that f is not a function. So that kind of shortcuts, you know, because you don't have to go through the whole process using the bullet list and all that crap, and all you have to do is to identify, you know, which element in the domain makes f not a function. But when f is a function, I would probably just say, okay, just confirm that it is a function. You don't have to tell me why. Because basically, you just cannot find a reason that it is not a function. So for the lack of a reason it is not a function, it is a function. Second, for the last example? Yeah. Because if we do not test when e equals, when e equals to, our conclusion at that point is, yep, f is a function. It is until we test for the case when e equals to 2 that we realize that f is not a function. So we're looking for one case. For at least one case. Yeah, at least one case. Yeah. Exactly. So in order to confirm that f is not a function, all we need is an answer of false to just one element in the domain. But in order to confirm that it is a function, we then we need to look at every single one and make sure they all answer with a true. <coughs> because all of these are ended together, so that means I need a true for every single case, because you know, it's, a, it's a conjunction. Mm -hmm. Scroll up, okay. To the second one or the first one? This is our second example. And then the first one is up here. Yes. And it's false for two reasons now. <laughs> Right, so if this is if this was 1A, 1B, then this will tell us it's false, this will also tell us it is false. Now, do we need both to be false for the whole thing to be false? The answer is no, but if I were to follow this mechanically, then it will end up with two false in the conjunction. Yes? Uh, does the phrase the element of the domain must be marked to a unique element of the code? Not yet. Yeah, so in order for this to be a function, they all just have to map to one and only one element in the code domain, so they can all map to the one same thing, so which is example, five. Like one a and two a would be a function. That is correct. Yeah. Yep. It does not need to be used. 
uniqueness is not a part of the qualification of being a function, but it is a qualification of being an injective function. So when we introduce the concept, concept of injection, then we'll talk about uniqueness. So but that's, a, that's a good uh, mentioning. So I'm going to do this one more time, and this time you know, is to evaluate what you just mentioned. So we will have you know, 1a and also 2a as elements of f. And we, we, want, we want to go through this evaluation. So this part does not change, right? So this part, uh, okay. I think we need to scroll. I need to scroll. There we go. Okay, there we go. So for this particular case, when e equals to 1, we still only have 1a one as the only element of you know, things that start with 1. And as a result, the answer to this question is still true. But for the second one, when e equals 2, it is not much different from the first one, okay? Because uh, in, the, in this case, we have um, the only element in f that starts with a 2 is 2a. All we care is, do we have one and only one element? We don't care about, oh, but a has been mapped to before. That's not part of the requirement. So as a result, this is going to be true. So now we have true and true, which means this is still a function. I did not pay, so I don't think I can do that. <laughs> I can export it, you know, so that you guys can have a copy of that. But it's also, you know, recorded. Yep, so that's the other thing. It's mostly about the way of thinking of, you know, about these things. And, you know, and also one thing we can consider doing, I know it is difficult, is to put this in your own words and write it in your notes. Now, you can do it now, you know, which can be difficult because you're trying to pay attention, but you can also do it after the class, you know, just kind of go through, you know, the example. If I just kind of give you a PDF of this, you know, you can use that as a basis, but you kind of need to write it down in my own words. How does this happen? How do we evaluate the universal quantifier for this particular purpose? Okay. Um, so just remind me after class, you know, to upload this, you know, to, um, to the announcement. That's usually where I would put it. <coughs> All right. Cool. So the next question or the next section is a little bit interesting. So why do we need to know the concept of a function in this particular way? In a math class, a function typically does a very specific thing, like tangent, sine, cosine, and so on and so forth, right? In this class, we have functions that are much more arbitrary, okay, which means uh, you know, the purpose of the function is to do something like this. So the way we do the mapping is not something that is actually quote unquote mathematical. Okay? You cannot just plot it out and see some nice you know, diagrams. Okay? So one thing, one reason why we have to study functions is how if you are a professor, okay, so we'll flip <coughs> our roles. If you're the professor, and you want to write you know, a homework assignment description to have your students to write a sorting algorithm, okay? How would you describe you know, what kind of program will get full credit? I don't even care about efficiency. I only care about the outcome, okay? I give you an array that is not sorted to begin with, and the program needs to give me an array that is sorted. So how would you describe it? And you have to assume that the students do not understand the word sort, okay, in the context of algorithms. So how would you write that using just mathematical symbols? Okay, does everybody understand what I'm asking? Okay, so using only mathematical symbols, okay, not referencing the word sort, okay? You can still use order, okay, you know, how would you describe the proper outcome of an algorithm that is supposed to sort the values of an array? Okay. In semi-math term, you know, but you know, it has to be very precise 
there are no two ways to interpret the what we are requiring the students to do. Yes, go ahead. Okay, okay, so let's start with that. Okay, I'm, I'm glad somebody, you know, actually, you know, kind of at least give it a try, which means, you know, that is not <laughs> the whole answer, but I appreciate, you know, the attempt, because it is the attempt that really counts, okay? If everybody knows the proper answer to every question I have to ask, why do I have this job? Okay, but even that is not sufficient. It, it is less than or equal to because the array can have duplicate items. So, okay, let, let me start with, um, I, I want to type really fast in this case because you know, otherwise it's going to take a long time to do all the formatting and whatnot. So I'm going to use Notepad because it, it's just a text editor. I can do it really fast. So let's say uh, A is the array, okay? A has N items in it, okay? So just you know, some basic you know um, parameter of what we're dealing with. So what you're saying is you know, for i in zero to n minus one, n minus two actually, you want um, a bracket i to be less than or equal to a bracket i plus one, right? More or less, okay? And it's not sufficient. Because if this is the requirement that my professor is asking me, I would do something like this in C code. I would just have to say for i equals to zero, i is less than n um, plus plus i, a bracket i equals to zero. Then it meets all the requirements that you specified, because zero is less than or equal to zero. I just make everything zero. Yes? Yes, I would probably make one of the worst students in my class. Okay, I actually was not a bad student, okay? When I was a student, I was actually a very, very good student, even though I can think of things that can trouble the professor to the end. Okay. But you can see the difficulty of this already, right? So you guys would go like, okay, um, so I need to specify <laughs> everything that was in the array before the algorithm still has to be in the array. And nothing else. And nothing else, exactly. So every value that was in the array has to appear in the array once and only once. Okay, and that includes duplicate values. If it has, if, if a certain value appears twice, it can it also has to appear exactly twice after the array is sorted on top of this requirement. So the question is, how do you express that? And as it turns out, <laughs> that is not easy to express. So we'll go ahead and take a look at um, other attributes of functions. Let me turn off my uh, speaker because I think I'm getting a lot of pings from uh, Discord. Oh, by the way, that reminds me. Um, there's a computer science club meeting tomorrow at 1 p.m. in room 305, which is right across from this classroom. So if you want to join the computer uh, science club, and particularly if you want to be an officer, you know, that would be a good time to kind of go meet the other people of the computer science club. Um, I can tell you a little bit of um, what they plan to do this semester. Um, we are planning to blend computer science programming people with cybersecurity people. So we're going to start with you know, people bringing their spare laptop computer will install a version of Linux, or we will make it do it with, you know, using Linux on a separate external hard drive. And after that, we'll set up virtual machines in Linux, and then we'll set up a virtual network in Linux, and then we'll have one computer acting as the bad guy in the network, and we'll try to launch attacks on the other computers on the virtual network. So that's kind of the grand scheme of what we want to accomplish, how far we can go, it's a whole different question, but that's kind of what we want to do this semester. It's kind of like a blend between computer science, programming, and cybersecurity. So if you are interested, okay, you'll try to make it to the meeting tomorrow at 1 o'clock 
stem 305. Okay. All right. So now that we know that you know, our vocabulary has a big hole, okay, we cannot even tell our students what being sorted really means, okay? Now we need to expand our vocabulary to include something else. And why is my computer not letting me? There we go. Okay. So we are done with this module, okay? Because the whole point of this module is uh, I don't think we know enough your terminology to get this done, okay? So now we go to the next uh, module. I'm going to skip rotating today because I would much rather spend the time to talk about injection and surjection than bijection. So we are now into functions already, and this is the next module. This is where we were before. This is now where we are, okay? So uh, this is also just a good opportunity for me to nag and say it is important to keep up with the reading material, read everything that we have talked about so far, and read a little bit ahead, okay? Because that really helps with understanding the concepts. So we'll start with injection, okay? So here's injection. An injective function, which is also called an injection, has each element of the domain mapped to a unique element in the codomain. Let's assume the function of interest is f, where x is the domain and y is the do codomain. In other words, we start off saying that Oh, you have to know that f is a function to begin with. Because if f is not even a function, I don't even, whether it's injective or not, does not even apply. Is that okay? So the assumption at this point is a little bit different. f is not just a subset of the Cartesian product between x and y. f is a function to begin with. In other words, that long, obscure expression that we were just talking about is already true to begin with. Okay? So now we say, okay, what else? Okay, this is one way to say that f is a not only a function, it is also an injective function, or it is an injection. So now we look, yeah, go ahead. I don't know those particular ways of referring to the properties of a function, so I can probably look it up, but in this class here we call it injection. So this is one way to say that f is an injection. Okay, knowing that f is already a function, this satisfying this requirement makes f an injection. So what does it mean? What does it mean? Okay, how do we read this? The first thing that I want to remind people is not to throw your hands up and give up. <laughs> okay, every time you see symbols like these, really dig into it. Okay, you know, process it slowly, okay? Be patient about it. And that's why you have to allocate enough time to study for a class like this, because it is not meant to be quick and easy, okay? For every p in x, okay, what is x? x is the domain of the function. So that is for every element in the domain and for every element in the domain, okay? So p and q are both coming from the domain. The next question is, do they have to be different? Can they be the same? The answer is yes, they can be the same. Because consider for all p in x as a loop, okay? For all q in x is a nested loop. So yes, p and q can potentially be the same element from the domain. Is that okay? So knowing that, when we try to understand what this is saying, this part here, okay, in, in the in the innermost parentheses, it says P does not equal to Q implies F of P does not equal to F of Q. So what is it saying about when P and Q are the same, you know, then what happens to the implication? It is true, which means I don't really care, okay? Because it is a for all, right? You know, this is nested within two for alls, which means it is part of a really, really gigantic, okay? Disjunction or conjunction? Conjunction, very good. And what does the value true does to a conjunction? 
nothing because it is the identity of conjunction, okay? So that means, oh, if P and Q are the same, I don't care. I'm not doing a single thing. I don't even bother to do this comparison. But if P, P and Q are different, then I need to make sure that P, F of P, which is the function F applied to the value of P, does not equal to the function F applied to Q. So that's one way to look at injection, or I can also say that every element in the domain maps to a unique element in the coding. Right, so I'm gonna pause, okay, yeah, we still got about 10 minutes today, but I'm gonna pause a little bit here and see if you guys have any questions about the quantified expression and also you know, how it should be interpreted, which is, Every element in the domain, it has to map to a unique element in the code. And how do we evaluate this using the method that we talked about just a little bit earlier? Okay, so think about that. Okay, so I'm going to use an example, okay? Because I think an example is always helpful in cases like this. And I'm still thinking about whether I use Joplin or whether I use a uh, note. Uh, mouse pad. I think mouse pad is fine for this. So I'm going to go to mouse pad if I can find it. Mm. Where did I put it? There we go. Okay. So I'm going to make this a little narrow so that I can still see the expression here. And I am going to say that um, x is the same as before, okay? It helps to stay you know, with what we already know or are familiar with. So y is still the same as before. It's just a, b. f is, um, we'll do two examples. I think we might have enough time to do two. So 1a and 2b, like that. And now we want to evaluate this whole thing here, okay? Now, how do we do this? Well, remember what I said? Each, each quantifier is a loop. When you have a quantifier applied inside another quantifier, all that means is you have a nested loop. So that means from the control structure, it looks like this, okay? F, I mean P equals one, P equals two, those are the two cases for P. But when P is one, guess what? Q can be one, Q can also be two. When P is 2, Q can be 1, Q can also be 2. Is that okay? Because all I have done at this point is to set up the nesting of the, of the loops and show you every iteration of the nested loop. So that means when I'm here, P and Q are the same. Okay? In other words, what we are really evaluating is P, which is 1, Q is also 1, 1 does not equal to 1 implies f of 1 does not equal to f of 1. Uh, is that true or not? Okay, p does not equal to q implies f of p does not equal to f of q. Okay, as an expression, is that true or is it false? Who said false? <laughs> it is true. Okay, so how do we know this is true? Exactly, because P and Q are the same, which means P does not equal Q is false. But why would false turn into true for the interpretation? Because that's how the truth table defines. When the left hand side is false, the implication is true. Okay? So at this time, that truth table should have been pounded in your head by you not by me, okay? If you're waiting for me to pound it in your head, keep waiting, because I'm not gonna do that. Because there's no way for me to pound something in your head. You have to do your part to internalize the truth table, okay? All right, so this is true, okay, good. What about this? Okay, so what about this one? You know, P does not equal to Q implies F of P does not equal to f of q. What about this one? Well, q and q are obviously this different this time because p is 1, q is 2. So you look up the function, 
f of 1 is a, f of 2 is b, e, f of 2 is b, e, a does not equal to b is true. So that means we have true on the left hand side of the implication, we also have true on the right hand side of the implication, that means the implication itself is true. Okay, cool. So this is also true. And this one is, I mean, these two are really easy to figure out, okay? Because this one is really the same thing as what we just worked with, except your P and Q are reversed. So we can, we know the answer to this question already. I'm just going to copy and paste. I'm still getting used to this keyboard because uh, it's, if the layout is different from my old laptop computer, so probably muscle memory you know, doesn't work anymore. All right, what about this one? P and Q are both two, so that means P does not equal to Q is false already. I don't even have to say the rest. <laughs> I know this is true already. Is that okay? So what do we have? Remember, each for all is a gigantic, potentially gigantic conjunction, and then the a for all on top of a for all is a conjunction made out of conjunctions, which is exactly what we have here. So we have true and true as one conjunction, true and true as a conjunction, and then the result of true and true is ended with the, the result of true and true. What do we get in the end? Yeah, it's just true. Okay. So now we got, I'll show you an example where it is not an injection. So we'll go ahead and copy this. Actually, I can copy the entire thing and just change some of the details, okay? So this time I'll give you 1A, 2A, okay? All right, so the structure of the loop is still the same. P is still gonna have the value of one and two. When P is one, Q is still gonna have the values of one and two, okay? So the control structure is not changed. What is gonna change is you know, the answer to these questions. So I'm going to take out all of these so that I have to you know, actually go evaluate each one individually. Okay, and this one may or may not be skippable, so I'm going to you know, also you know, spell it out like so. Okay. Uh, yep, that is correct. Okay. All right, so let's consider this one first. Okay. Um, what do you think is the result of this one? It's true because P and Q are the same. Okay, so this one is true, and I can you know, also use the same trick and just go all the way down here and say this is true too. Does everybody understand why I can do that? Why I can just kind of conclude right away and go like, okay, these two are not of concern to me. Because the left-hand side of the implication is false. Okay, so what I really need to figure out is this one and this one over here. So let's take a look at this one here. So when we evaluate at the Blinky cursor, P is 1 and Q is 2, right? So now we know that 1 does not equal to 2, okay, and it's true, which means I really have to evaluate the right-hand side of the implication. What is F of P? F of 1 is A. What is F of Q? F of 2 is also A. A equals 2. A does not equal to A is false. But wait, that is not the reason why we put a false here. Because now we have true implies false, which is false. So the result of false is not only because of f of p does not equal to f of q, it is because it is on the right hand side of an implication where the left hand side of the same implication is true. Okay? So technically speaking, I can start right here. Because if there's one false in one conjunction, and the result of that conjunction is ended with the result of whatever, okay, I can make a conclusion and say the whole thing is going to be false anyway. But I'm going to have, you know, I have one more minute, so let's use that one minute. Okay, so in this case, uh, we have P does not equal to Q, but in this case, P is 2, Q is 1, which is basically just the reverse of the first one. So now we have f of p being a, f of q is also a, because p is 2, q is 1, so we end up in the same scenario, so this one is also false. So the end result is 
the, the final condition that we have absolutely evaluated is true and false as one, false and true as another one. So this is false, this is also false. But then those two values are also ended together. So we have false and false condition. They don't agree false. So that's why this is a function, but it is not an injection. It is not an injective function. So is this method of working okay? Does it really kind of help you uh, spell out the operation with the quantifiers? Hmm? Okay, excellent. All right. Um, so we are running out of time. Today is Wednesday. I'll see you next week. Don't forget about the homework assignment. Nobody asked me about the homework assignment. It's today, not in class. So don't forget about it. You can still kind of <laughs> procrastinate until like next Monday, but remember to turn it in. I don't want to hear someone going like, I got everything done by Thursday, but I just forgot to click the button to submit it. Okay, and this is coming from someone who keeps forgetting to record the lectures. <laughs> All right, have a nice weekend. I'll see you guys next Monday. What generation do you drive? <laughs> I drive a, I used to have a N N A, N -A. Um, but I got into a tiny little rear end rear end accident. Mm -hmm. um, so that scared me enough to get something that has anti-lock brakes. So my current one is an NC. Oh, okay. I'm glad you guys are not an NA. Yeah. I really like the looks of an NA, you know, um, the, the, happy face. <laughs> the happy face. And uh, some people program the uh, the headlight so they, can, they have independent control, mm -hmm. so you can blink it. Yeah. yeah. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a cheap car to maintain. Yeah. Once you buy the car, maintenance is easy. Some people like to track it a lot. You can track it. Um, you can just, it's also a good day to drive it too. Then, you know, you know, I don't think I have to wear, ever worry about people stealing my car. Because, okay, talking about necessary versus sufficient condition. To steal a Miata, there are multiple necessary conditions. One, you have to fit in the car. Two, you have to know how to drive a stick shift. And three, you better find a way to sell that car because it's not going to be easy. Okay. <laughs> you too. My dad drives a, a stick shift in Kona. He was in Kona. Um, they got working on these bikes for like the last month, but they can't steal it because they're not going to get it. That is the ultimate shame for car thieves. <laughs> okay, whatever you do, take pride in what you do and be good at it. Okay. You're looking at a stick shift and go like, we're going to skip this one. It's like, it's a for that. I have a question about yeah. that. I don't understand how the, so when you're like evaluating the expression, why does F mean, why does F mean F mean not to the evaluation? So, so, so this is basically saying yes. yes. F of one yes. is A, F of two is A. That's basically yes. what you just say. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so P. So P and Q would go to the first one. Correct. Uh, 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 the uh, actual yeah. side of the result. So yeah. P is, so because we, we use P and U, right? So whatever you put inside the parentheses as you apply the function, that is the domain. The, the value that the function returns is in the code. Okay, I thought, okay. Yeah, I was thinking that it was the element itself. So, and not for that, not like, not, not like in the tuple already. And then, yeah, the, the, the job of a two tuple is to say one in the domain maps to A in the total, which in a more traditional way of saying it is F of one is A, F of two is O. Okay. So when we, so when we say F is P, we're looking at the tuple that has the value of P as it's the name. second item of the two tuple. The first one is for looking up, the second one is what they return. Okay, that makes sense. So if you look at it as a, a, key, a key value pair, then you have the key here, this is the value. So the key is P and the F is P, the return statement is the value value. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Could you please give the, um, the canvas for us? That we can
just more time. <laughs> <laughs> I can do that. Um, we'll go ahead and run yeah, so let me let me do this first. Uh, this is just a regular text file. So now I can say close that one. And then the job one. Job link does not have a very good export feature, but what I can do is I can just select all in okay, let me see if I can select all here. Select all and then do a control C or copy. Let's copy. Copy. There we go. And now I can just paste it into a regular file. Thank you. And I also have another question. What about injection? Injection is less time or 